So welcome and good afternoon to everybody joining us today for the introductory webinar to the Patrols Project. Thank you all very much for joining us. My name is Claire Skentelberry from the Nanotechnology Industries Association, and I'm joined by Shireen Doak from Swansea University Medical School, who is the project coordinator. We'll kick off our webinar by letting you know that it is being recorded and will be available on YouTube after it is finished. We will keep most of our delegates on mute today, if that's OK, to retain the audio quality. But as we go through the webinar and we get to the Q&A session, we will, you can be unmuted and can both ask your questions directly or write them in the chat function of the webinar control panel. So let's get started today. Our agenda is a very simple one. It is really an introduction to the patrols project as a whole, starting with the drivers behind the design and the development of patrols in the first place, looking at its scientific objectives, the impact that it intends to have before we move to the questions and how you can get involved. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Shireen, who will take over here to describe the background to the project and the scientific objectives within it. So take it away, Shireen. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, well, hello to you all. I'd just like to extend a, a very warm welcome and, and thank you for, for joining our webinar today. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of, of what patrol is and, and where it's come from. Um, and to start that off, I just wanted to, to begin by providing a little bit of background in terms of the nanotechnology industry itself, because in part, this is what um, stemmed or, or uh, resulted in a lot of the questions being raised around regulation um, and what we do with novel products that include nanomaterials. So the nanotech industry itself has, has really evolved quite considerably so over the, the last 10 to 15 years or so. Um, and nanotechnology is very much considered a key enabling technology. We have a whole range of, of nanomaterials, nano-enabled products and nano-intermediates that are already finding their way into the marketplaces. And nanotechnology itself is really starting to enhance a variety of aspects within our lives. Um, because these materials are already included in products across very wide ranging sectors, everything from the cosmetics industry right the way through to the aerospace and, and automotive industries as well. So their applications are really very quite um, very wide ranging. And as such, um, the global nanotech market is expected to grow significantly so, such that its value is likely to be worth just short of $174 billion by 2025. So it really is quite substantial. And not only is it providing us with clear lifestyle benefits, but there are also economic benefits too, because obviously if you have healthy industry, that means high value jobs, which bring their own economic benefits for, for a given region. However, but what we are now finding is that the science behind nanomaterial development is very much racing ahead of regulation and this is starting to, to present something of a barrier because we, we have to have appropriate regulation in place to ensure that anything new on the marketplace um, doesn't pose any risk to human or environmental health. Um, and we do understand that there may well be some issues with nanomaterials in that regard, but the major issue at the moment is the fact that we haven't really got appropriate tools to fully evaluate nanomaterial safety. And this is causing something of a bottleneck in terms of getting new products onto the marketplace. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. So in terms of... Um, safety testing for chemicals, we've got a very, very well structured framework in place and it includes both mammalian um, and ecological safety testing. What you see on this slide here are just the key categories um, that need to be covered in a registration dossier for mammalian toxicity testing and underneath each of these headings there are actually multiple tests there's not very it's not often only a single test that's required for each of these um, parameters for the first four you'll notice that you can actually conduct in vitro experiments to evaluate some of these endpoints but um, if you have a positive or an equivocal outcome, very often you have to repeat those tests and generate some confirmatory data in vivo. And for the last panel of tests for acute 
toxicity onwards, um, it's generally in vivo testing that we rely on. So you can see by just this single slide that we've got limitations in terms of what we can do in vitro, but with regard to nanomaterials, there's another um, there's another level of, of challenge, if you like, because what we now appreciate is that our standard hazard assessment tests are not all fully appropriate for testing nanomaterials, and this is particularly true of the in vitro assays themselves. Next slide, please. So although we have made great strides in, in understanding key aspects of nanosafety over the last 10 years or so, what we are now starting to appreciate more and more so is that our standard in vitro hazard evaluation strategies are simply not sufficient. Um, and this is because they have a whole host of technical problems associated with them, which means that the test methods aren't always relevant or reliable for nanomaterials. And one aspect of this is, is interaction. We, we do observe that nanomaterials, because of their heightened um, reactivity, are capable of reacting with a number of components within our standard in vitro assays, which mean that their outputs can't be wholly relied upon. Now, in many cases, we have actually already got adapted methods in place. Um, but the problem there is that at the moment, those methods haven't been standardized. And so again, they can't be used widely and certainly not um, necessarily within a regulatory framework. Now, although we face all of these challenges with regards to nanomaterials, what we also need to appreciate is that there's certainly room for improvement with our in vitro tests with regard to chemical assessment too. This isn't a, a nano only specific problem um, and there's a general appreciation that we could actually do with much more physiologically relevant in vitro test systems. The reason for this is that our current in vitro tests are largely based on a single cell type that's grown flat at the bottom of a flask and that's clearly very far removed from the, the 3D human body, if you like, which clearly contains um, and can, is comprised of multiple different cell types that all interact with one another and communicate together. So because of the, um, I wouldn't like to say unreliability of in vitro tests, but they certainly have limitations. And because of that, it does mean that we are reliant on having to test in vivo and go into animal testing. That's clearly not sustainable on many levels and for certain industries such as the cosmetics industry they actually can't conduct in vivo tests anymore and so there really is a, a, an urgent need to develop a new generation of in vitro assays that are more reliable. Next slide please Claire. So our current in vitro tests have really stood the test of time, it must be said. They've been around for, for a long, long time. And the reason for this is because they are very cheap, they're easy to conduct, they're generally very fast, which means they can also be applied for high throughput and high content screens too. But because these are 2D systems, they clearly suffer limitations when it comes to elucidating complex biological processes. It's widely recognized now, that these simple mod models do lack phenotypic detail. They don't have very accurate physiological function and they don't um, depict complex cell to cell or cell to matrix crosstalk. So this means that um, we actually find our models are not very physiologically relevant. And indeed, when you compare outcome with what you see in vivo, there are limitations in those correlations. So we really do appreciate that there, there's a lot of room for improvement because we can't do everything in vivo. In vivo tests are expensive, time consuming. Um, but aside from that, there's obviously the moral obligation that we have to, to minimize the use of animals. And, and there's very much a, a shared three hours vision internationally to reduce, um, replace and refine the use of animals in hazard assessment tests. So this brings me or starts to bring me on to, to key gaps within nano safety testing. So aside from the fact that we have these issues with our current in vitro tests, um, in silico tools for um, evaluating the safety of nanomaterials are also at a very early stage of development and, and have some way to go in terms of their um, uh, in terms of advancing their predictivity. The other issue with nanomaterials um, is that for, for most standard in vitro tests, short-term exposures are applied. They're typically four hours 
minutes or 24 hour durations. Now for chemical compounds that have got fairly short half-lives, um, this isn't too much of an issue. But for nanomaterials, many of which can actually be biopersistent and remain within a biological system, they don't always break down. Um, with regard to those sorts of materials, a short term acute exposure is perhaps not particularly relevant because if you're repeatedly exposed to something, for example, in an occupational setting or um, through a consumer product, that you would have repeated use of, the chances are you're actually going to be exposed to very low levels um, but over a sustained period. And for nanomaterials, this may actually mean that they would accumulate within the test system. This is quite a big gap in terms of our understanding because those long-term um, effects of exposure is something that we don't particularly understand. And that's also something that we need to, to build into our safety test testing regimes. Next slide, please. So this is very much where, where patrols comes in. So what you see on this slide here is the overarching aim for the project. And I'm going to read through this because there are some key aspects that I just want to stress to you to some extent. So patrols is aimed at establishing and standardizing a battery of next generation hazard assessment tools that are more accurately able to predict the adverse effects caused by long term low dose exposure to nanomaterials. Now, this is in both human and environmental systems, and the tools and models that we're developing are very much there to support regulatory risk decision making and remove some of the uncertainties that we currently face. The project itself is quite sizable um, and has a value of, of just short of 13 million euros, because as you may be able to tell from the generic aim or the overarching aim, um, we actually have a lot to achieve in a short space of time. It's a three and a half year project and it started in January of this year. So we're, we're six months into the project now. And if I could have the next slide, please. And here we have the, the key outcomes um, and goals that we intend to deliver by the end of this project period. So the first is that we are going to develop um, realistic, human lung gastrointestinal tract and liver 3d tissue models not only are we developing the models but we're also applying um, or, or developing endpoint assays specifically to evaluate nanomaterial hazards hazard assessments and the purpose of these tools is that by by increasing the predictivity of our in vitro assays we'll be able to reduce the need for subsequent follow-up animal testing Secondly, we're also going to be developing innovative methods for safety assessment in ecologically relevant test systems and organisms. And these organisms are going to be selected according to their position in the food chain, because what we appreciate is that when materials um, enter our environment, it may well be the filter feeders that are more prone to internalizing nanomaterials, but ultimately they'll be ingested by species that are higher within the food chain. And, and understand Understanding the impact of movement of material through the food chain is something that we, we, we don't have a lot of understanding of at the moment and will be developed through this project. Thirdly, we'll be looking to develop um, more robust computational tools. Now, these are for two levels of measurement. One is to um, predict and evaluate the impact of exposure and dosimetry modeling in a given, situ a given exposure scenario. And then secondly, we'll also be developing tools for improved hazard prediction based on in vitro, in vivo extrapolations. And then finally, we can't conduct any form of, of nano safety based work without having a very clear understanding of the physical and chemical characteristics of the nanomaterials under the relevant experimental conditions. Now, with regard to the models that we'll be developing in patrols, this is particularly pertinent because we will be using exposures that are more um, relevant. So, for example, with the lung models, we'll We'll be looking at exposing the models via an aerosol as opposed to introducing materials under liquid, which is not very representative of, 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 of an inhalation scenario. Equally, with our gastrointestinal tract and liver uh, models, 
you won't have pristine nanomaterials exposed to those cells because they would have been ingested in the case of the GI tract models. For materials to reach the liver, they've actually got to enter the body and move through the circulation. So there's very likely to be all sorts of, of transformations arising with those materials before they actually reach the target organ. And we'll be looking to mimic that within the models too. Next slide, please. So this schematic here um, really pulls together what I've highlighted on the previous slide. So if, if you look at the center of the figure, um, this flags the models that we're developing in terms of the pulmonary, the GI tract, the liver and the ecological models. Now, at the start of the project, we already had a number of these models in place but what we'll be doing through the duration of the three and a half years is introducing second and third generation modifications which will relate to mimicking more realistic exposure conditions but also more realistic um, mechanical properties of the models as well. Now clearly we can't generate in vitro models without having something to compare them to so we also have a very big activity um, that's focused on gathering all of the in vivo experimental data that's already available um, that's been conducted using either chronic or subchronic exposures um, internationally. And we'll be using that data to, to benchmark our in vitro models against. We've actually identified all of those studies and what we'll be doing is using the identical uh, materials that were applied in those in vitro, uh, sorry, in those in vivo studies um, on our in vitro models that we're developing so that we're able to, to um, draw the parallels between the in vitro and the in vivo outcomes. Clearly, our PhysChem work will be running in parallel through all of these investigations. And then the PhysChem characteristic data that's generated, the in vitro and the in vivo information will all be um, uploaded into a dedicated patrols database, which the computational teams will be using to develop in silico tools for predictive risk modeling. So in terms of um, key outputs from patrols, what we'll be generating is standardized SOPs for more physio physiologically relevant hazard assessment models that are really aimed at reducing uncertainty around safety assessment for nanomaterials. The second key output is the provision of data using these in vitro tools, um, basically to help provide confidence in the test systems themselves. So we will be conducting round robin exercises towards the end of the project with these models. Um, and the data that comes out of that will all be used to try and support better acceptance of the tools in a regulatory framework. I think something that we're acutely aware of is that we're developing these assays, but they need to be readily applied by industries or contract research labs that would be conducting these tests. And equally, they need to be acceptable to regulators, because if not, then there really isn't going to be a drive for using them. And so this is where working with end users and stakeholders is really very important in terms of patrols because we need to ensure that the tests are fit for purpose and that they would be used and implemented beyond the life of the project. Next slide please. So um, given the range of work that we're undertaking in patrols, what we've had to do is pull together quite a large team to, to answer the variety of, of um, challenges that we've put forward for ourselves. So Patrols itself involves 24 partners plus three affiliated international partners that span 13 different countries, many of which are in Europe, but we also have partners in Canada, the US, Japan, Korea and Taiwan. Um, and all of our partners are internationally internationally leading experts in nano safety, ecotoxicology, cell biology, systems biology, computational modeling, tissue engineering and material science. We've, we've really had to cover the breadth of a range of different areas to be able to address the, the aims and objectives of the project. Our partners are certainly not all academic. Um, they come from a variety of sectors, including 
government and risk assessment bodies, um, private and public research institutes, SMEs and multinational industries. And this breadth of international collaboration was really of great importance to us because we needed to ensure that the project of a whole, as a whole was able to learn and build on best practice that's currently available internationally. But on top of that, we simultaneously had to ensure that we would be able to develop the um, innovations that are required for the patrols project as a whole to really try and facilitate a global consensus on nano safety testing approaches. It's not something that we can do and be insular with. This is a, um, an international problem. And by working with partners in different countries on different continents, it will allow us to, to develop some answers that would be acceptable to all further down the line. With that, for the next part of the webinar, I would like to hand back to Claire. Thanks very much indeed, Shireen, for a really excellent introductory insight into the needs behind the project and the structure of the project. I'm going to speak briefly now about the intended impact of the project and the work we're doing to achieve that. So as you can see, as with many scientific projects, there are a range of different end users that we want to impact. And for patrols in particular, it's industry, it's the regulatory framework for nanomaterials, it's the scientific research community and the wider general public. So if we look briefly at the industrial impact, as many people will know, it's a great challenge developing novel nanomaterials, proving that they are safe and effective and having them integrated into products and enter into the market. As Shireen has already said, the market for nanomaterials is extremely broad already and they are integrated into all sectors in all aspects of the centres in several ways, uh, often as a result of refined process development for a particular chemical or a, different, a particular product or as a unique novel material with advanced functionalisation because of the nanomaterials used within them. And so for industry, there are very clear needs for them uh, with regard to demonstrating the safety of uh, nanomaterials. So as the cost of a product development becomes much more expensive as you move along the development pathway, companies, particularly small to medium enterprises, need a robust and relatively low cost mechanism early in the product development pipeline to, to assess any potential safety hazards so that they can either modify materials or use different materials as part of their product development. And as has always been, already been explained, there is an ongoing drive to reduce the number of animals used, obviously from ethical reasons and also from cost reasons as many products, particularly in the pharma sector, would not be developed if you had to test them on animals at an earlier stage of product development. In being able to build a portfolio of information about the long-term safety of your product as well, it also allows that product to have a much longer life itself in commercial use. And as the regulatory framework grows, it will also help companies to future-proof themselves against future regulatory changes which may alter the need for information provided. It is likely that the outcomes from the patrols project will be either accessed in-house if an organisation has the ability to set up um, tissue model development internally or they will be delivered through external expert researchers such as contract research organisations. When you look at the regulatory and legislative uh, stakeholders, Projects such as patrols are a vital part of providing a scientific base upon which regulation can be developed and implemented. Because for many years, the knowledge about functionality of nanomaterials has been faster than the understanding of the mechanism of action of nanomaterials and the potential management and impact on end targets. So, the 3D models that come out of the patrols project will be very useful in developing more robust regulatory frameworks and the standards that are often associated with those. Within the scientific research community, these are incredibly useful tools for early and translational research of novel materials, both from a safety perspective, if you're advancing safety research, but also from materials development perspective. 
So, for example, as we've already referenced within the pharma sector, it would be very strong for earlier stage researchers and translational researchers to be able to have an insight into long term potential toxic effects of uh, nanomaterials, both in organisms and in environmental accumulation. And finally, for the general public, this is not directly relevant to the public in terms of specific technical outcomes. However, pro patrols helps to add to information around the use of nanomaterials that helps demonstrate that sufficient safety testing is going into them, that the materials that they do enter into their products, whether they know about them or not, are safe and have been well researched. So it gives it helps contribute to an improved public perception of engineered nanomaterials. It helps demonstrate a reduction in the use of animals, which is highly relevant from a broader consumer perspective. And as it enables the development of a wider range of nanomaterials into products and into, uh, into marketplaces, it does give greater consumer choice uh, for future products with, that are nano enabled. So at that point, I would like to open up the floor for questions. If anybody has a question from our audience today, you can either ask your question directly or you can write it into the chat function of the webinar here, as you can see. Everybody's very quiet, but that's no problem at all. We will share all the slides after the webinar, plus the recording of the webinar, so that you could go away and digest this in a little more detail. So finally, I would say, the patrols project is still relatively young, uh, but we would very much like people to become involved from all different types of stakeholder. It's very important that the tissue models and the modeling tools that are being developed are fit for purpose, both for use in, for research into nanomaterials, but also into to supporting the development of regulatory frameworks. So our partners will be active in a lot of different ways. The project website will always be updated with latest news and information. You can also sign up to the project newsletter uh, and you can find that on the home page of the project website. We have a LinkedIn group where you can get day to day um, updates from the project and outcomes. And so we will post the slides and indeed the recording from this webinar within our LinkedIn group. And project partners will be active in conferences throughout this year and indeed in for the lifetime of the project. And we just list a few of the conferences that we'll be attending here. So that includes Eurotox and Nanotox, uh, In Vitro Toxicology Conference, the Industrial Technologies event in Vienna, and finally NanoSelf in Grenoble. So I'll just hand you back to Shireen to say thank you and wrap up the webinar. And we look forward to following up with people in the future within the Patrols Project. Yes, I'd just like to say thank you to you all for, for your time today. It's very much appreciated. Um, and we would very much like to hear from you, whether it be via email, um, you've got all of the contact details posted up on this slide. So please feel free to get in touch with us with your thoughts, comments on the project. We will be running a number of events throughout the project lifetime, including some stakeholder dedicated events too, so that we can get some feedback on the models as they're developing. Um, and you will find information about those events on the website as and when we're ready to, to present those um, pre present that information. Um, and that just leaves me to say I look forward to speaking with you in the near future. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shireen. Thank you very much indeed, Shireen. And we look forward to talking to you all soon. You are now free to go at the end of the webinar.